All right, I think our minute's up. Let's get going. Um, just welcome to the Dean Speaker Series. This is a series that we have every quarter, and I'm very grateful to my colleagues, Mark Openlander and Kate Barker, for organizing these every quarter. And the purpose behind it is to bring in a business leader to share with you their experiences in work and in life and to um, tell us a little bit about the companies they work for and work for and are working for and just to get an insight into their business leadership. Remember, a mission of our school is to prepare business leaders who serve business, government and economics and that's why we're excited to introduce you to business leaders. We, uh, you know, to, to learn from business leaders is a way that we can then reflect on the kind of leaders we want to be when we uh, graduate from here. So, um, I'm just very delighted to introduce Chad Cohen to you today. Chad is the uh, Chief Financial Officer at Adaptive Technologies, Biotechnologies, and he's been in this position since 2015. And he's here today with his wife Jackie, so we're very delighted to have her with uh, with Chad as well. Thanks for coming, Jackie. Um, Adaptive Biotechnologies is a commercial stage biotechnology company that's into some very interesting work. And talk about our mission um, to see business as contributing to the common good and healing the world. His company's right in the center of that in new technologies. There, our company reads and translates uh, the, the genetic code of the adaptive immune system with the goal of developing personalized tech diagnostics and therapeutics to improve patient lives. I don't know whether any of you I had an experience of my sister suffering from cancer last year, a very serious cancer, and, and was a beneficiary of some of the early stages of immunology and the way that uh, cancer and cancer drugs uh, uh, and, and, uh, are, are working with, with this kind of thing. So um, it's a tremendous field. The company believes the adaptive immune system is nature's most finely tuned, tuned diagnostic diagnostic and therapeutic for most diseases. But the inability to decode it has prevented the medical, medical community from fully leveraging its capabilities. Their proprietary immune medicine platform reveals and translates the massive genetics of the adaptive immune system with scale, precision, and speed to develop products in the life sciences research, clinical diagnostics, and drug discovery areas. They have two commercial products already, and a robust clinical pipeline to diagnose, monitor, and enable the treatment of diseases from, such as cancer, autoimmune conditions, and infectious diseases. Their goal is to develop and commercialize immune-driven clinical products tailored to each individual patient, and that's what's so exciting about what they do. Prior to going to Adaptive, uh, Chad, since uh, from 2006 to 2015, uh, was the, uh, well, various roles, but most, most recently before he left he had to go to Adaptive was the CFO of Zillow. And right on the ground floor of when that company started in 2006. So he has a really wonderful story to tell there as well. He started off on the board of directors and then started to get into various roles uh, in, in the Zillow group. You all know about Zillow, right? A real estate data driven, very interesting dynamic company. And I know a lot of our grads uh, love to, love to, would love to work at, right? So, especially you folks in quantitative methods, is that right? All the data people here. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, prior to joining uh, Zillow, Chad was, uh, Chad was the assistant controller and financial integrity ma uh, manager at Ticketmaster in LA from 2003 to 2006. And prior to that, he worked at uh, Ernst & Young, which is as you know, a global accounting firm, and he had some stints in Australia and in various locations. And he previously served on the board, and I've been looking at this, I've just got a new puppy, right? I'm trying to figure out whether I should get pet insurance or not. But Chad used to serve on the board of directors of True Pena, which is a uh, pet insurance company. Is that right, Chad? Right. Yeah. And so I don't know whether he can give me a little insight of whether it's worth it or not to take the plunge into pet insurance. Um, Chad uh, worked on their, their, their audit committee quite a bit as well. Um, Chad holds a BS in business administration from Boston University. And it's, he has also been a mentor over the last 10 years to many of our students through the mentor program. 
and uh, and it's just and it's actually hired some of our students. One student, Ben Koshi, who works with you now, and I think there's some, several others work with you. And so thank you for your interest in our university chair, and we're delighted to have you and Jack here today. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. It looks like I underdressed today. I look like one of you versus uh, some of the faculty of the professors that are here today. So thank you. <laughs> um, so thank you again. It's wonderful to be here for the speaker series. I'm delighted. Um, as Dean Stewart said, I've been a mentor for the past 10 years. I've menteed uh, about six or, so, or mentored six or seven students here, and it's been a wonderful experience to connect me back to academia and hopefully give them something back to the students to enable them to help further pursue their professional aspirations. So it's been, it's been great. Um, you stole a lot of my thunder, but I'm gonna recap it a little more uh, in detail. Um, so I do wanna take you through uh, my journey, uh, my professional journey, and then we'll have a quick discussion of risk, what risk means to me and how I manage risk. And then we'll talk a little bit about uh, Adaptive's recent uh, initial public offering, which was in late June of uh, this year. And uh, I think that'll be a, a fun discussion. If any questions come to mind during the discussion, feel free to raise your hand, speak up, or happy to take your questions at the end, but happy to make this also as interactive as you want it to be. So what did it teach me? Um, it taught me that patience is not necessarily a virtue. Um, it's great for your family, but when you want to get stuff done, sometimes not, the best thing to do is not to wait around uh, for it. And that to get ahead, you need to move, move quickly. To be persistent, um, don't take no for an answer. Keep pushing through and breaking through walls to get what you need. How to negotiate. It's really interesting. Who, who's been to Hong Kong here? Can you raise hands? Have you been, if you've been to a shopkeeper's uh, or a retail shop, you'll notice that there's one thing on everybody's desk, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a, 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 a 10 button calculator, just like the most basic calculator. And there's one thing that that's for, and that's to negotiate. So at a very early age, you've got a calculator sitting across from you in a shopkeeper's retail shop, um, and you use it to convince that shopkeeper to give you the thing that you're after at a cheaper price. And so you start early learning about that the quoted price, the listed price for a good or a service, isn't really what the actual price is. And so you learn how to negotiate. And I've taken those lessons into my role as a CFO um, you know, over the past 20 years. And lastly, um, you know, just based on my dad's own entrepreneurial sort of run in Hong Kong, that risk and reward are highly correlated. And we're gonna get into what it means to take risk in a second. I've been very lucky in my career, um, and it's sometimes better to be more lucky than good. Um, I've had a lot of great opportunities, and some of those opportunities have come um, through just haphazard chance, uh, for example. I graduated from Boston University in uh, 1997, and at that point in time, I didn't have a job, didn't know what I was going to do. I was living in Boston, and I said I would come home for the summer and just sort of figure things out. Home was Los Angeles. And it was around that time in the summer of 97 that I uh, was starting to call some of my uh, mentors that I had had. I said, hey, do you know of anybody that's hiring? I'm, I'm open to roles. Just I need, I need to get my hooks into something. And uh, I got an opportunity in San Jose at a company called Novellus to be a tax intern. And I didn't know anything about tax. I didn't think it was that particularly interesting. Um, I really wanted to be a CPA, but I had really missed the window of applying to the big four firms. But I said, what the hell? I'm gonna go pack up everything I have and take a tax, inter tax internship for the summer up in San Jose at a company called Novellus. And Novellus is a capital equipment manufacturer in the semiconductor space. So if you think of a semiconductor um, producing, like a semiconductor fab producing a transistor at the end of the day, they sold one of the pieces of equipment, cost about a half a million to a million dollars a pop, that go through uh, that fab and help produce that transistor, that semiconductor. So I decided to go up there and take a tax internship for the summer. 
and um, I spent my first three weeks in Silicon Valley living in a Motel 6 <laughs> because this, was all, this all happened very quickly. I didn't have a place to stay. And so I drove up in my beat up old 240SX, my Nissan 240SX, that could barely make it up to San Jose. And I lived in a Motel 6, which was pretty depressing. Mm -hmm. And um, ate hungry men meals for three weeks as I'm you know, microwaving them in my Motel 6 uh, microwave. That um, role ended up turning to be a very important role for me because it catalyzed uh, some of the other relationships that I made at Novellus and proving out myself in tax for a few months led me to becoming a financial analyst. And so I spent the next year as an analyst uh, for Novellus doing high level forecasting, budgeting. We installed one of the earliest budgeting packages, software packages in the field back in 97. I remember the name was called Commander Budget. It no longer exists, I'm sure. There are millions of these packages out there. But we installed our first uh, big piece of financial planning software and that was a big, big coup for the company and sort of moved us away from Excel into something that was more um, uh, automated from a, from a forecasting perspective. So I spent a year at Novellus and it was through that time that I met a lot of the other um, managers and leaders at Novellus and realized that they all either had MBAs or CPAs. And I said, hey, if I really wanna get ahead, I should really think about either going back to school and getting my MBA or getting my CPA. Well, I didn't want to take any more debt because I think I was already fifty or sixty thousand dollars in debt and way over my head. So I said, "Hey, let me look at the big four firms as a way to grow my skill set and my expertise and get some good perspective about the type of industries that are going on in Silicon Valley." It was a wonderful time in the Valley um, because it was really the first dot com revolution, and just about anybody um, who had any sort of business model, put a dot com after their name, and already had a multiple of 30 or 40 times their, you know, four, you know, two years revenue. And they were hiring like crazy, and the whole place was exploding. I mean, the place, the Silicon Valley was exploding with different types of business models, some that were structurally never going to make money, others that were. And it was really a wonderful time to be in, be in the Valley. And so I took a job at Ernst & Young. I applied to E&Y and, and Price Waterhouse and decided that EY had um, a better client base and started doing audits of um, high technology, semiconductor, software, and the first sort of stable of internet companies back in 1998 after spending that year at, at Novellus. And it was an absolute wonderful time. I got to see a lot. And I really encourage those that are thinking about um, getting into public accounting to really look to one of the big four firms to the extent that you can to really get that breadth and depth of experience because the exposure that you get to those types of companies is absolutely wonderful. So I spent two years at E&Y in San Jose, um, did a number of initial public offerings there as an auditor, uh, which was a really interesting um, role to play as an auditor because back then it was, I don't know if you remember the exuberance of the late 90s where everybody had free lunches and there were volleyball courts at Yahoo and all this sort of fun stuff was going on and this was very exuberant time and that even came down to these IPOs which were very exuberant where you would go to the printers and there would be somebody there giving you massages at 12 in, <laughs> in the evening, keep you going um, and all sorts of other things. Um, I then went from Ernst & Young in, in San Jose and parlayed that into an international secondment and spent two years in Melbourne, Australia, still with the technology communications entertainment uh, division, but then got some additional exposure into things like commodities trading and geotechnical engineering and other more, um, you know, more you know, industries that are more germane to sort of the, uh, the Australian uh, country. So came back after uh, four years at Ernst & Young across two continents and there was a great role at Ticketmaster implementing the first version of Sarbanes-Oxley back in 2000 and worked there for a few years and parlayed that into increasing levels of management responsibility and ended up as assistant controller for Ticketmaster which was effectively me running the entire accounting organization for the United States for their domestic organization which is about a billion dollar top line revenue org. Um, who's bought tickets with Ticketmaster? Who hates Ticketmaster? All right. 
Ticketmaster is not that popular in Seattle, but I can tell you it's a very well-run financial, has a very well-run well financial organization. It's effectively a bank. And um, so Ticketmaster um, really helped me get a sense of scale and how to run a big organization. Um, and was before Amazon came along, it was probably one of the leading e-commerce players uh, on the internet. Back when I was there, about 25% of all the commerce at Ticketmaster took place on the internet. Um, they used to sell through outlets and box offices as well, but it was 25%. When I left, just in the span of like four years, north of 60%, and I'm guessing now it's probably north of 90% of all Ticketmaster sales are done, done online. So it was really interesting to really understand how to grow an e-commerce function uh, within a large scalable organization at that time. In 2006, I met uh, some folks that had done very well at Expedia and were starting something new, and they wanted to revolutionize the real estate industry and had um, come together to form Zillow. And I took a role as controller, and I was the first full-time finance hire at Zillow back in 2006, and decided at that time I would move from uh, Los Angeles, where Ticketmaster was. I was li living in West Hollywood with, with my wife, and took a flyer on this company called Zillow. It was pretty well capitalized. They'd raised about $30 million. Didn't quite have a business model yet, but what I did know is they wanted to revolutionize the real estate industry by putting a home value on every home in America. And when I started at Zillow, um, they had about 40 million homes in their database and had a Zestimate on top of every single one of those homes and had a platform business where, hey, if I've got all the homes in America, well, at least 40 million, that grew to eventually over 100 million homes, then there are, there's lots of flexibility and optionality in terms of how I want to monetize that platform. And so that platform business was really interesting to me from a financial perspective because there were a lot of ways for that company to monetize the audience and the data that it had on the platform. So from 2006 until 2015, I worked at, at, at Zillow. I helped tape them public and uh, as CFO. I was promoted to CFO in 2010. And then for four years afterwards, um, I was CFO and helped uh, acquire a number of different companies that had different parts of the technology that we needed to bolster our platform and also made some very transformative acquisitions. One acquisition was called Trulia. Does anybody know who Trulia is? Trulia was the second biggest player in the real estate space at that time, and we purchased them for $3.5 billion, with a B, um, in 2015. After 16 quarters, um, uh, 16 earnings calls, uh, you know, about a dozen acquisitions, and had built out a great team. There were about 70 people on my finance team. Remember, it started with just myself. Um, I decided that, hey, it was time to start a new chapter in my life. And I had just met on a ski trip sponsored by Silicon Valley Bank, two brothers, Harlan Robbins and Chad Robbins, who had started a company called Adaptive Biotechnologies. And Adaptive had been around um, for four or five years before then, so it started around 2000. And Adaptive was spun out of the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research um, Center, which is here in Seattle, which is one of the top cancer research centers in, in the country and, and, and in the world, frankly. And Harlan Robbins, um, who was the scientific co-founder of the company, discovered a method uh, for sequencing your adaptive immune system. Um, and just getting to adaptive for a second. So, if you, if you know about your, your DNA, you've probably been thinking about it as your sort of static germline, right? If you pull a, a, a hair out of your head, if you swab your cheek, if you scrape some skin cells off, the DNA from your skin, your hair, and your cheek are gonna have the same static germline, right? Um, your adaptive immune system is quite different your adaptive immune system are basically your T and B cells in your body um, that are acutely aware of all the different types of pathogens that have come into your system and are the most finely tuned diagnostic and also therapeutic um, because it's evolved over hundreds of millions of years being challenged by all the bad things that nature can throw at it. 
Um, and so over the course of hundreds of millions of years, this s system of biology, which is really complex, we all knew at some level that the immune system had some way of detecting disease and then reacts to disease and reacts to drugs that are in your system, but nobody really knew how. So what Harlan developed was a way to really barcode your adaptive immune system, these hundreds of millions of T cells and B cells in your system by just taking a little bit of blood out or taking some marrow or taking some tissue, sequencing that and then looking at it like a barcode and saying, hey, what does the balance sheet of my immune system look like? How many T cells are they? What's the quantification of them? What kind of clonality of these T cells and B cells are they? Meaning how many times has that exact T cell or B cell uh, replicated and, does it, and, it, and when it replicates, it carries that unique genetic tag, that DNA that's very specific to that one T cell or B cell. And so the ability to actually see the immune system and understand uh, how it's clonating leads us into a big opportunity for the immune system in terms of diagnosing and treating disease. And so this technology was spent out of the hutch. Um, Chad Robbins, who's our CEO and other co-founder, his brother, raised a bunch of money. We raised a half a billion dollars in private uh, funding uh, through the course of being a private company. That's an astounding amount of capital. And when there's a big opportunity, like you're looking at a very complex system of biology where you think there's a big market for this next generation of diagnostics and therapeutics, you need to be well-funded. By, by way of comparison, Zillow, which is also a gigantic opportunity in real estate and changed the way people buy and sell homes, raised $80 million. So $80 million in real estate, which I thought was a ton of money, to $500 million as a private company with Adaptive. So we have this massive database um, of immune system uh, sequences. And not only do we understand what this, these immune system sequences look like and how your body responds to disease and responds to those, those pathogens and responds to drugs, uh, but we also know where we're starting to learn about what your immune system uh, actually is responding to which is really interesting. What are the antigens, those, those, those proteins that are carried by those pathogens that create an immune response? What are those specifically and what parts of your immune system are actually attaching to those antigens? And when they find a good pair, because theoretically there's a good T cell receptor, a good adaptive immune system receptor to every bad thing that comes into your body, if it latches onto that one bad thing, it creates a clonal response and in a period of a few days to a week, you generally feel better. If you ever get sick, it takes you about a week to mount an immune response that means, so that your, your T cell that is responding to that just rapidly uh, clonates and kills all those bad pathogens and you get better. It's when your immune system fails to detect those bad pathogens that are coming into your system that you get sick and you die. So we all probably have cancer to some degree in this room. Every single one of us probably has lung cancer but it's the fact that your immune system is acting in response to that cancer, it's keeping you healthy and it's keeping all those bad pathogens in check so you're not getting sick and you're not dying. We have a number of really important partnerships. Uh, we have one with Microsoft where they actually came in in a private round in our series F1 private round, which is our last private round as a company, where we're working with Microsoft to develop a suite of diagnostics that use the immune system to detect disease. Um, and we have another, a number of proof of concepts that we're trying to get out in terms of infectious disease, autoimmune, and cancer. And um, what Microsoft is applying, and for those quants in the room, is they're, uh, they're applying quantitative analysis to try to help us connect T cells in a limited number of patients to populations of people and they're using a lot of compute power to try to do so and a lot of their quantitative um, analysts all over the world and trying to create those relationships for us. We then have this other partnership with Genentech, which is a very large biotechnology company owned by Roche, which is probably one of the largest biotechnology companies in the world uh, based in, in Switzerland. And the way we're working with them is they want to understand how the immune system actually goes and creates therapies. And specifically, we're working with them to create cellular therapies and oncology. 
So specifically looking at ways to create personalized cancer therapies that are safe for all of us, but really bad for the cancer based on your own immune system, right? So Genentech um, came in at the end of 2018 and they paid us $300 million up front as a one-time payment um, to get access to our technology to license in those immune system cells. And then on top of it, are paying us to the extent that we achieve our goals, $1.8 billion in regulatory and commercial milestones over the course of our relationship. And additionally, are taking, we are taking royalties on top of that. So it's an absolutely massive deal and the potential is for billions of dollars if we're successful in um, monetary compensation from that deal. Right now, we have a blood cancer diagnostic um, in ALL, a multiple myeloma. It's been approved by the FDA and reimbursed in Medicare. And we also sell our uh, technology as a research tool to hundreds of biopharma companies and academic um, institutions uh, around the world. So that's adaptive. It's a very exciting place to be right now because there's a big convergence in health technology of massive amounts of compute power, and compute power is growing at more than two times Moore's law, which is very, very quickly, right? We're learning about, I don't know if you saw the most recent uh, quantum applications from Google came out and they said, hey, we can do something in just a few minutes what could take regular supercomputers 10,000 years. Imagine applying those learnings in a health technology setting. Absolutely amazing down the road if you actually get um, real use out of that type of technology. We are also playing this next generation sequencing space. Um, and we're also playing in this trend of population-based diagnostics. So it's a really interesting place to be. There's a lot of money and capital flowing in from venture capital and, financial and various um, investment institutions around the world moving their money into the space. So I want to talk about uh, risk a little bit. Um, who's had a discussion about risk in their, in their business classes here? What, give me, what are the lessons in risk? If anybody could just throw out a few terms. What do you hear? Maybe don't take risk, don't take too much risk. Manage your risks. What else? Risk and rewards are related, kind of Ri like you said. That's right, risk and reward. Take on the more possibility of return that you have. That's exactly right. So I'm here to say take risks. But what this should say is take calculated risks. This is uh, from Merriam-Webster. It looks like a pretty scary definition of risk. Um, and it could be. If you're jumping out of an airplane, that's pretty damn risky. Um, if you're at the Wynn Casino and you want to put your entire life savings on 35, that's pretty risky. You could win. I've done it before. It's pretty fun when it happens after a few cocktails as well. But um, this, is, this is a very scary definition of risk. But there are a lot of other ways to take risks that aren't quite as scary, um, but that can help you as a leader, especially a growth company CFO, like I like to characterize myself as, move the ball forward. So f first things first, I think all of you are here because you're risk takers. In some way or another, you took some risks. You decided to um, give SPU four years of your life, in some cases maybe even more. There are a lot of op other opportunities out there you could have taken. You could have stayed closer to home. That's less risky. You could have worked for your parents' business. That's way less risky. Um, some of you got in a car to be here. Some of you walked across the street. You're all risk takers. It's just a matter of how much risk you're willing to take and what your appetite for risk is. At the growth, as a growth company CFO, you have to have a healthy appetite for risk. You have to be okay with the unknown. So here's a list of a, a few ways to take risk. Um, take a controversial position in a meeting. You know, if the entire room is, if nine out of 10 people are saying X, Y, or Z, say ABC instead. You know, maybe don't do it to be just, just to be provocative, but if you really believe in it, state your opinion, stick your neck out a little bit. That's taking risk. Um, the Israelis call it 10th man. If nine out of 10 Israelis in a platoon are, want to take a hill to surround an enemy, 
They literally have somebody on that team called the 10th man whose job it is to take a contrarian position and to be devil's advocate and take the other side of the position and help people think about what they're doing. So, you know, think about taking the other side of a position if you believe in it. Find interesting companies to work for that are trying to change the world. Um, that's risky. Changing the world's hard. Disruption is really hard. And you're going to fail more times than you win, but when you win, it feels really good. And, um, you know, when you win, there's a, there's a chance to make, um, you know, in terms of optionality to create wealth, there's a lot of optionality to create wealth. So find interesting companies that are trying to take, take you know, change the world and do something different. I did that with Zillow, who was trying to change the real estate industry and revolutionize it and put power to the people in terms of their real estate decisions back in their own hands. And at Adaptive, we're doing the same thing. We're trying to change the way drugs are developed and diagnostics are developed and trying to do them cheaper, better, faster, and deeper. So find companies that are trying to change the world. Um, but be prepared to fail. And when they do fail, be prepared to move quick. I'll get to that in a second. Join a startup. It's really fun. Um, you can go work for big established companies. You can learn a lot. I've learned a lot from, from big companies, best practices. But nothing will help you grow faster than joining a startup and taking on more responsibility and growing with that company as it goes through, hopefully, uh, asymptotic, you know, up into the right growth. It's really, really fun. And if you do a good job with that as a leader and staying on top of that growth as that company is growing, again, you can get to interesting places in your career. So build, help build a business. I think it's really fun. And then as a growth company CFO, and, I, and I've said this many times, you might even see it on posters out here, is the most important thing I can do is help businesses allocate capital. So we have at Adaptive over $700 million on our balance sheet. We are not profitable. It's going to be a while before we're profitable. But understanding where the big opportunities are and how to allocate that money that we have, that balance sheet, against all the different opportunities that we have to help grow and scale a business is really important. So allocating capital involves risk. Um, you want to diversify, obviously, um, to the extent that you can. But you need to allocate capital. What you can't be is this guy. You know who this is? Scrooge McDuck. Scrooge McDuck, what does he like to do? He just sits on his money. That's right. He sits on his big pile of money and he counts his cash. Um, and he doesn't take much risk. He just sits on it. He sits in it, he counts his money, he tells people no. He's, he's sort of like curmudgeonly and he's sort of like a crappy person. Um, no one wants to really hang out with Scrooge McDuck. He's not that fun. Um, don't, don't be this guy. That is the CFO of the 1960s and 1970s. You don't want to be Scrooge McDuck. You want to be a growth company CFO. It's a lot more fun, trust me and figure out ways how to say, instead of no, how to say yes or maybe, and reserve the right to say no if there's a really bad answer, but spend some time really thinking about the opportunity. It's really easy to crap on um, an idea. It's really easy to say no. It takes a lot of guts, though, to say yes, and let me figure out a way to help support what you're doing. That's what growth company CFOing is, and I think it's really important. For me, this is where I find my special place in companies as being that growth company CFO. I'm great, I think, um, as a private company CFO that's looking to change the world. I'm great a few years out in a public company setting, but I would probably be a very bad CFO at a company like a General Motors or a Packard or a Boeing or a Unilever or some company that really is just looking to squeeze an extra penny or two out of their EPS every quarter. That's just not for me. Um, and uh, maybe it will be in 20 years, but who knows. Um, so I, I have three rules as a growth company CFO. They're, they're, they're pithy. They're easy to remember. Um, bad news travels faster than good news. Why? Because I'm taking risk, which means I want to set up lines of communication to the company so that if we're going way over on a budgetary line item than we planned, if there's fraud or embezzlement or something that's just illegal somewhere in the company, God forbid, somewhere in the company. I want to know about it faster than anybody else. Um, if it looks like our unit volumes for sales um, aren't going to meet our projections for the quarter for the years, I want that to travel faster than good news. It's really important because then I can course correct, right? I'm taking risk. I'm, I'm risking all this capital, but 
The flip side of that is I need to compensate with good controls and good communication. Finance is about communication. You can't, can't just go into a dark corner of um, a business and, and, and CFO. You have to build relationships. Those relationships have to trust you and your opinions. Um, and it's important that you get information out of deep, dark corners of your business. And so you want to set up lines of communication um, to make healthy decisions as a CFO. So bad news needs to travel faster. Second thing, as a growth company CFO, you need to move fast. If you're at a growth company, that means it's exciting. You're deploying a lot of capital. And guess what? The competition's after you. There are a lot of other companies in the space that are also acquiring capital. There are VCs that are moving capital in that space very quickly. Your competitors are seeing an area of opportunity that you're also seeing, and they want to deploy capital there. So you got to move faster, and you can't just say no or hold up the rest of the business with red tape. You got to move effing fast. Um, really important. And sometimes when you move fast, you're going to break shit. Oh, there I go. I said a bad word. You're going to break stuff, and that's okay. And you should break things. You should break things and press your boundaries. But you need to know how to unscrew it if you do break things. And that's really quickly. So having compensatory controls in mind when you're moving quickly and understanding what your contingency plan is when you break those things is really important. So you can go back and fix them rapidly and course correct and tack into a different um, part of the, the opportunity. Really important. Any questions on, on this slide? So moving off of risk, I'm going to talk about something that's, I think, really interesting. Does everybody know here what an IPO is? So what I want to do is just talk through um, and really try to make this part of the discussion interactive. If you do have questions, please raise your hand. An IPO is an initial public offering, as you know. And it's the first time a company sells a portion of their business to public investors, to the buy side. These companies are like Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, Wellington, Barron's Capital, Viking Global, names, some of those names you've heard before. And when you do sell your business to public investors for the first time, most IPOs generally range in the area of 10 to 15%. You're issuing 10 to 15% more common stock to those new investors than you had before. Remember, as a private company, you're taking on, you're selling preferred stock, which have certain preferential rights to investors. And those preferred rights, those preferential rights, go away when you have an IPO. Everybody is effectively on a level playing field in terms of your equity, for the most part. And so you're selling common stock, and everybody that was in on the private round has the preferential rights of their stock, their preferred stock, turn to common stock as well. So why do you go public? These are the top four reasons I can think of to go public. One is you have a big opportunity, you're not yet profitable, or maybe you are profitable, but you want to continue to deploy capital against this big opportunity. In Adaptive's case, we outline that opportunity is at almost a $50 billion opportunity across research, diagnostics, and therapeutics. That's a big opportunity. If we can just take a few percentage points out of there, I mean, that's, that's Yahtzee. Um, but we need capital to move into that space, to build infrastructure, build a sales team, build out laboratories, um, hire great people. 45% of our expenses of our investment goes to people. And that's huge. So you need to hire a lot of people. Um, Second is, depending on the length of the holdings of your current investors and how long your employees have been around, some of them might be a little itchy and a little antsy to get some liquidity out of the business. And so liquidity for your employees who have worked so hard to help you build that business, every adaptive employee is a shareholder. shareholder. Every employee at Zillow was a shareholder as well. And that's very commonplace now, where as part of your total compensation package, you should be looking to get options or RSUs as part of your compensation practice. And those are various forms of owning stock in the company and help incentivize you to make the right long-term decisions as an employee in terms of helping build out your company. And so over time, you want to be able to remunerate your employees with that stock, whether those are options or different types of stock units. You might have a business where 
there are technologies that other companies have that you need, and you need to bolt them on. These could be big companies or small companies um, that have different pockets of employees that have certain talents and skill sets or different technologies that have been built. And you need to create a currency for uh, yourself to go out and buy those companies. And having stock in a public company is a great way to um, buy those other types of companies. In some cases, you're going to deploy stock. In other places, you're going to deploy cash in stock. And, separate, and, se and lastly, you want to diversify your shareholder base. You don't ever want any one particular shareholder as a public company to have too much control uh, over your business. So diversifying your shareholder base is extremely important. You can do that through the course of an IPO. I know this is a bit of an eye chart. Um, but I wanted to get the entire IPO work stream, and this is probably 90% of it, on one page. And let me um, talk to my recent IPO. So we went public in, uh, on June 27th this year, which is the first time our stock, a, uh, tri uh, under the ticker ADPT, uh, started trading on NASDAQ. Um, and we had a goal of having about a summer-ish IPO when we thought about the process last year. And if you think about this as the largest school project that you'll ever do, um, it's like a capstone project for a management team, it is a massive project. This is a six to nine month project. So we started thinking about this back in the October timeframe and it really started with making sure that we had the infrastructure and the people and the audited financials and everything we needed to stay public once you are public, which means that you have to file quarterly financials. And the longest pull in that tent is getting your financials audited um, by a public accounting firm. And so you had to start there. So get your financials audited and make sure they're super... Uh, squeaky clean <laughs> before you get to a point where you're ready to go public. So uh, since the Jobs Act, um, you only need two years of financial statements to go public. It used to be that you needed more, but two years now, two years of comparative financials. You then need to hire investment bankers. Um, investment banks are like Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, Morgan Stanley, um, and there are a lot of others. And um, what investment banks do, and those are called sell-side banks primarily, so differentiating those that buy your stock, those are called buy-side institutions, with sell-side banks, your investment banks, you have to hire some sell-side bankers. And the way you pick your sell-side bankers is to figure out who's going to help you tell the best story to Wall Street. Who has the best way of characterizing that story that you're going to tell, that's your story, management story, about their business to the street. And so what you have is a banker bake-off, or otherwise called a beauty contest, where all the banks come in uh, one at a time for two to three hours at a time, and they pitch you on how they're going to tell your wonderful story to Wall Street. And they bring everybody. They throw the kitchen sink at it. Um, and you'll get the entire team. In our, in our case, it was the healthcare uh, investment banking team at each of these big banks. They would come in and pitch us and how they're going to tell the best story. Um, how they are going to position our stock, how they've got the best distribution and equity capital market cap capabilities. Um, and so we held a series of events, these um, bake-offs, um, for over three, four days in which each of these banks came in and pitched us why they should lead our IPO. So you choose a bank, um, and in our case, we, cho we chose uh, the creme de la creme, Goldman Sachs, uh, to lead our IPO, along with J.P. Morgan, uh, another fantastic healthcare investment bank, uh, to co-lead the IPO. J Goldman Sachs was on the left of our um, syndicate, and I'll tell you why that's important. They were lead left, and uh, J.P. Morgan was just to the right of them as our two co-lead book runners. You form a syndicate. The syndicate is a group of banks that takes you public, and once you're public, the syndicate dissolves. They stop working with each other. But over the course of this IPO, all these banks that are generally competing with each other help to create all the right uh, process and the dynamics to enable you to go public. 
You then pick a marketplace. It's really easy. There's only two of them, New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. There's no, there's no buffet here. Uh, pick, pick one or the other. They all sort of do the same thing, um, but it was important for us to secure a good, good ticker, which we did, ADPT, and we picked a, what we thought was a more of a technology-oriented marketplace, which is NASDAQ. They're an electronic traded exchange, but if you want to pick New York Stock Exchange, that's great too, and they actually have a physical bell you can ring uh, when you go out. It's a little bit of kabuki theater. I don't know. Anybody watch CNBC in the morning? It's, it's all kabuki theater. That's like 99% of all the stock is traded uh, electronically, and they do their little you know, dog and pony show for everybody every morning. Um, you educate your bankers at an organizational meeting. The organizational meeting is part of the stream of due diligence that is conducted by your banks to get to understand your business. And it is exhaustive. Not only do you have to present in front of all your banks, your attorneys, your auditors, over the course of a day or two, and it's really the first time at this organizational meeting that they see how well does your management team present? Do they understand the story? Are they correctly um, relating and communicating all the risk factors in the business, the size of the opportunity, how you're set up to project and forecast your business, um, all your intellectual property and your propri proprietary technology? You sort of have to describe to them in, in excruciating amounts of detail. And then you have to give them access to your customers and your vendors, and they do all these sort of checks in the marketplace to make sure that you're not a Theranos effectively, right? Um, that you're not uh, a fraud, that you actually do what you say you do. And so they conduct an excruciating amount of due diligence through data rooms and in a data center, and it's, and it's really painful. They um, look at all the claims you have about your business. I'm the leader of this. Well, tell me how you're the leader of that. Prove to me that you're the leader. Right? And so you look at the various marketing claims of the business as well, which is a huge part of this due diligence. You then write your S1, your prospectus, otherwise known as a red herring. Uh, it's called a red herring because the initial price that you put on your prospectus may be not the final price that gets filed with the SEC when you're about to file. So it's a bit of a red herring, they call it. And your S1 includes uh, a summary of your business known as the box, which includes a summary of your financial statements. It includes your risk factors. It includes your technology and your IP. It includes your financial statements and your management's discussion and analysis. You then file all of that with the SEC, and they have a 30-day window in which to uh, review your filing and uh, approve it for marketing. During that 30-day window, you're educating your sell-side research analysts. These are analysts that work for the bank but can't talk to the bankers. They're the ones that are initiating coverage on your story and also helping educate the buy side on your business. And they publish research papers quarter to quarter and they publish a research paper at initiation when your company goes public. So you have to educate this whole separate group of bankers called research analysts as well. You hold testing the waters meetings. You fly around the country and you educate the buy side, these companies that you're hoping will buy your stock in the IPO, and you educate them about their story, and you test out your pitch deck and your, pres your, your roadshow deck, and you see whether the story resonates. If it's not resonating, you gotta go back to square one, but if it resonates, you can fine tune your story. You come back and you respond and clear your SEC comments after 30 days, and then you launch your roadshow. You price and launch the offering, and then you deposit the proceeds. The roadshow. The roadshow is about seven to eight days in the market after you filed your initial prospectus um, that is called the red herring. It's the, it's the prospectus that has an initial price on it. Through the course of those seven or eight days, you will meet hundreds of investors. It is exhausting. It is brutal. It's like a hell week pledging a fraternity. It's awful. Um, <laughs> It's awful and amazing at the same time because you get to meet some very, very smart investors who really understand the space. And the only way to meet with hundreds of investors is to fly private. So for those who want to fly private at an early age, I highly encourage you to go work for an investment bank because there's um, a member of the Goldman Sachs team who took us, um, took us public and he's having a very good time um, on the private jet um, in, indulging in lobster tails and crab cakes. Um, and 
So there is an upside to it as well. It's pretty fun. Um, but it is exhausting. You're talking to hundreds of investors. We talked to north of 40 um, investors in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And most of those investors that you talk to in a one-on-one -on -one setting doesn't mean you're just talking with one investor. For example, if you're at Fidelity, they could bring the entire Fidelity biotechnology investment team to the meeting. It could be five to 10 people. They could bring a technology uh, manager. They could bring a generalist. A uh, number of different analysts who are serving those portfolio managers and you're there with your team and they're asking you questions and you're telling them about your story through your pitch deck. It is exhausting. One day, um, and I honestly forget whether this was Zillow or Adaptive because they sort of blend together, we started in New York, we drove down to Philadelphia to meet, we started the morning meeting with investors in New York, drove down to Philadelphia, met with additional investors. Um, through that time, I think we also drove to Princeton, New Jersey, I think BlackRock's there. We then hopped on a plane to um, Baltimore, right? Met with additional investors and then flew to Denver that evening. That's one day. It's brutal. And so every morning you wake up, you're like, what city am I in now? I forget. <laughs> and you tell that story about 200 times over the course of the seven or eight days. By the time you tell it the 30th time, you could tell it in your sleep. You've just got this great rhythm and cadence and you're, you become a total pro, but it is exhausting. So over the course of that seven or eight days, you're talking to investors, and what you're doing is you're building an order book. These investors are, um, are, are getting contacted by your bank's sales team, by their capital markets team, and they're asking them whether they want to buy shares in this IPO and at what price. And so it's, it's like an auction model. You're building this book. Uh, I'll buy, to buy so many shares. It's so much of a price. And you build that book over the course of your seven or eight days. In the case of uh, Zillow, when we did this, we were, I think, north of 50 times uh, subscribed on an $80 million IPO. That means we built about $4 billion of demand. Uh, is that right? Is my math, am I off by one? $400 million? That's $4 billion, I think, right? Of demand. Um, and in the case of Adaptive, we had $6 billion uh, in demand. We generated 25 times um, our $300 million IPO in actual demand. And you want to have that sort of level of demand in the business and in the book to be able to continue to increase your price to what you think is a fair price for you as the issuer and for the street as the buyer. And so you do all of this and then you finally file your final prospectus. And here on the left hand side, you've got Adaptive's final prospectus in which they show the offering price at $20 a share. We were raising about $300 million uh, initially. Um, the underwriting discounts, which are about 7%, and then your net proceeds to the company of $270 plus million. You can see on the bottom left-hand side, uh, the Goldman Sachs is our lead left banker right there. That's a very important position for a bank. That tells the whole world and the street that Goldman Sachs ran this IPO as the lead left. That gives them the ability to go out and pitch themselves in additional um, uh, banker bake-off meetings as the company and the bank to take companies public. JP Morgan and Goldman both, they effectively co-led it. JP Morgan did a lot of the work as well and they shared in the economics. Bank of America, Merrill Lynch was another active book runner. And then we rounded out the syndicate with other more passive book runners with Cowan and Guggenheim Securities and two smaller boutique banks, William Blair and BTIG. So these seven banks formed our banking syndicate. In the, in the case of Zillow, we raised about $80 million, uh, which is a much smaller IPO, but still a decent size relative to our market capitalization. And we had Citibank take sole books, meaning it was only Citi who ran the IPO. Um, and we rounded them out with a number of additional banks in, in the syndicate here that I'm having trouble reading. Um, but again, these are the final prospectus. This is where you want to be. This is what's filed with the SEC and is um, lodged um, right at the time that you price your shares. The only thing that's not here is this uh, notion of a green shoe. Does anybody know what a green shoe is? Anybody in the... Any professors know what the green shoe is? <laughs> the, the green shoe is a, um, 
is a vehicle that's used by the banks to help stabilize your price in the aftermarket. What happens is that 15% of your IPO gets sold short to the street. And the reason it's called the green shoe is that the first company to ever use the stabilization agent, this green shoe, this, this, this amount of, these amount of shares that are sold sh short to the street, was Stride Right Company, which was originally called the Green Shoe Company. They make little cute kids' shoes. Um, and um, the green shoe is very important because what the banks do is that they will sell these short, these shares short to the street, which means that they will borrow the shares from the, from the company and they will sell them and collect the proceeds. If the stock starts to tank, which means you overprice the stock at the IPO, they will use those proceeds to buy back shares in the open market and help stabilize the stock and make the stock go back up to where it is. If the stock starts to go up, which is what you want it to do, they will take that, those shares that they have sold short and they will release them and they will close out that short position and deliver those additional 15% of those proceeds back to the issuing company. It's really a fascinating way that the banks use to stabilize the street, um, street price. And I encourage you guys to all look at the mechanics. It's really, it's really fascinating. And so in the case of Adaptive, the green shoe uh, was sold over the past, uh, over a few days. And therefore, instead of $300 million, we raised before um, underwriting discounts about $350 million. And we netted about $321 million off the IPO. So at the end of the day, um, two successes. Um, on the right-hand side was a picture of um, the adaptive uh, management team, as well as a number of key employees. We, the, the Roadshow team, which consisted of the CEO, our co-founder, uh, president, and myself, who were on the road telling the story. We brought our families with us. That's my daughter. Uh, that's Maya in the front there, and that's Ava and Jackie and everybody else. And then you can see on the left-hand side, there's me looking a lot younger, uh, less gray hair. Um, back in 2011. So that's, that's all I had today, but I'm happy to take uh, your questions. Um, and, and thanks again for you know, giving me your time. Probably have about 10 minutes for questions. Sure. Um, I noticed that throughout like, the trajectory of your career, you've gone obviously in the finance realm, but between a lot of different kind of business sectors from real estate to healthcare. And can you talk a little bit about like that learning process for you and what that's like? Because mm -hmm. you have become very familiar with creating value in a very specific kind of market mm -hmm. with a lot of expertise. So how do you transition between those fields? That's a really good question. I, I, I think what's helped me over my years is the is some of the perspective that I've gained working in, in big four um, to start off my career. Because you see dozens of companies as an auditor. You see what works really well and what doesn't. You're in front of lots of different management teams and accountants and um, corporate finance employees. And so the perspective in terms of scale, in terms of what companies were well run versus poorly run, um, who, who ran a tight ship, who didn't, um, has you know, uh, given me, uh, at least as an, as an early operator of, of a company, um, some good perspective and some good um, muscle memory, I would say, right? So when you're uh, in my role as a, you know, sort of finance operator, I would say, um, I'd say 70 to 80 percent of the skills that I have are transferable across industry. Pretty easy. I'm a bit of a Swiss Army knife in, in that, in that um, case. You can drop me into a real estate media e-commerce company. You can drop me into um, a health tech uh, biotechnology company. You could drop me into a manufacturing company, uh, doesn't matter what it is. And I think 70, 80% of um, you know, what I've got in my, my toolkit today, I'd be pretty successful. The last 20 to 30% is really friggin' tough. Um, and I would split that up between um, things that are really sort of germane to the business. In the case of adaptive, um, learning the science was really hard for me because I didn't have a science background. And so first, just simply repeating and parroting back what I hear um, helped me develop that muscle. And then it was like the last or 10 or 15% was, you know, how does this place actually really run? You know, what's happening in 
the laboratory. What, um, what are the key um, KPIs and metrics and what's the way I really need to help instrument the business and get ahead of the forecasting and how does that impact accounting and you know, revenue recognitions are really um, you know, big topic nowadays and it's, it's highly complex. So it's that last sort of 20 to 30% I find that are generally pretty hard and the first 70 80% I find that are pretty applicable across industries and across companies. Thank you for the question. So earlier you were talking about how being part of a growth company you move fast and sometimes when you move fast things break. Can you talk a little bit about that in your career in general? You don't have to go too specific, but when something broke and you had to fix it fast. Yeah. Um, I mean, I can remember an example where we just started getting overwhelmed at my last company with um, the current HRS system that uh, we had, for example. And we made a very hasty decision to um, adopt a new HRS, a, uh, Human Resources Information System. Sorry, to, it's like alphabet soup in the corporate world. Um, and so we, we deployed an HRS system that was really untested. Um, in, in many respects, we brought on a consulting company um, that has four letters in its title. I won't give you the name of it. Um, <laughs> um, and, and that consulting company had not deployed that software before. And so the sort of combination of a new system implementation, which is risky to begin with, um, coupled with a company that hadn't really deployed it successfully was an absolute recipe for disaster. And so after a number of months of really trying to get this piece of software to work and trying to deploy it, stabilize it, um, we realized we were, it was a bit of a fool's, fool's errand. We had broken something that had worked before and deployed probably about a half a million dollars in capital against this HRIS system. And so one thing that's really important also is knowing when to sort of cut things off, right? is um, it's um, you know, not throwing good money after bad money. It's the sunk cost fallacy, right, if you've heard of that. Not using emotional decisions to sort of guide your investment thesis. And so after spending a half a million dollars in deploying this piece of capital, um, we realized that we were headed down a very, very bad path. We moved too fast. We didn't really understand what the capabilities were of the system. We didn't understand what the capabilities were of the consulting company. We didn't stress test it far enough. So the lesson there is, hey, when you're making big decisions, especially expensive ones, maybe slow down a little bit, right? And think about what you're really trying to do and do enough due diligence um, such that you, you make the right decisions. But if you're going down a bad path, don't be scared about you know, cutting something off even if you've spent a lot of money on it, because the worst thing you can do is to continue to you know, um, buy into that sunk cost fallacy and put you know, good money after bad money and just perpetuate the issue. question. I think, you know, in your, in your particular position or just in any, anyone that's trying to find a voice for themselves to be heard, it's about trying to create influence, right? And um, how, do you so, how do you start to socialize, if you've got great ideas, how do you start to socialize those ideas and gain influence around your peers? and around your core relationships, around the business, so that everybody starts to buy in at some level into your thought process and into your thinking. So it may not be that um, those above you are ready yet because they haven't started hearing it from those around you. You haven't developed yet that sphere of influence that you need to push those ideas forward. So 
I would say start to think about how you socialize those ideas and create influence around your peers, around those that are you know, maybe one or two rungs above you. And so you build that momentum for yourself and so that when you finally get to a point when you're in a meeting and you put forth an idea and you're sticking your neck out, you have a lot of heads that are nodding alongside with you. I think and it doesn't matter what the, what the topic is, but I found that to be successful is to take, take a little bit of a pause and to really build that sphere of influence. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, okay. Yeah, how do you see your internal ethics and morals kind of play out in how you make decisions on a day to day and more like a larger framework? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think financial integrity is very important, right? And I think it starts with who you hire. Um, my guess is there's no class here at SPU that teaches you how to hire. Am I right? It's probably one of the most important and critical steps in building a business is learning how to hire. And my rule is you, you can always look for smart people, right? There are a lot of smart people. Everybody here has met a certain bar um, to be here at this university, right? A certain academic bar. Um, and at a company, you can meet a certain bar of aptitude. But what's really hard to find is to meet a certain cultural bar and a certain bar, especially for a finance department in terms of ethics and integrity. And what I try to do is hire for that bar first, right? So if I hire for that bar, and it's really friggin' hard, man. If you hire for that bar first, and you say, hey, who do I want to work with day in, day out? When things go sideways, who am I going to get the straight dope from? Who is not going to try to politicize an issue? Who am I going to be able to um, just trust, right, in terms of the information that's coming down the pike? Again, as a, in finance and as a CFO, you play the role as a fiduciary to the business. You're more than just CFO. You actually have a fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders and to the street even if that means that your CEO is stealing from the company, you're the one, or your general counsel for that matter, that have to stick their neck out and do the right thing for the business. And so it's important that you hire for that criteria. You hire for people that you want to work with, that fit your cultural bar, that are culturally additive, may not fit exactly into that phenotype you're looking for, but are additive to the culture and enhance and enrich that culture. Um, but you also hire for financial integrity and for ethics. And it's a great question to ask somebody when you're hiring. If something was going sideways and you saw X, Y, or Z, what would you do? And let them talk and see what they say. I think that's a, it's a great question. And it's really important that my team, as um, you know, the overseers of our balance sheet, um, make sure that we bring people onto the team that are highly ethical and use that as a North Star. Maybe something back. Hi. You mentioned the importance of taking risks. Can you speak up just a little bit? Yeah, you mentioned the importance of taking risks. And yes. I'm wondering when you decided to take the risk on adaptive biotechnologies. Great question. Um, you know, when I was at Zillow, we thought that um, because real estate is generally, for most Americans, the largest asset that they have, right? Your real estate asset is the largest financial asset that, uh, that, that most Americans have. And that finding great homes and, to buy was a very noble um, pursuit. When I think about healthcare and um, you know, creating longevity in lives and improving patients' lives, it just takes that pursuit that we had at Zillow and ratchets it, ratchets it up about 10 times. Right? There's nothing more important in this world than finding ways to improve people's lives through healthcare, in my view. And it was a very noble pursuit. I, I honestly didn't know much about the company when I decided to take the role. I knew that they wanted to change the world by using this complex piece of biology to diagnose and treat disease. But I couldn't tell you the difference between um, a T cell and a, and a T Rex. I, I had no idea. I mean, I had no friggin' clue. <laughs> Um, and, and, and I needed to hear it like a million times in order to understand what it was. And now I can BS my way through most, of, most discussions on adaptive immunology, except when I have an actual PhD here who's like, okay, you're completely wrong. <laughs> you're, like, you're just full of it. Um, but for me, it was this noble pursuit. Everybody in this room has been touched by somebody who's gotten sick. 
right? Anybody, everybody in this room has probably been touched by somebody who's gotten sick and probably died. I have, um, and it's, it's terrible. And so to the extent that you can improve patients' lives, and not only that, use your immune, own immune system to do so in a way that's really exquisite and a way to bring down the cost of healthcare over time as well is really important. So for me, I thought that was noble, a uh, little bit of a higher calling. Um, and so I decided to take the risk, not knowing really much about th what the company was doing scientifically or technologically, but I said, this company is really well capitalized. They want to change the world. They have really smart people who are really engaged in the mission of doing something here that's really important. Why not give it a shot? Uh, on behalf of the School of Business, Government, and Economics, I want to thank Jeff for coming. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. I know some of you probably have to move on, but we might be able to convince him. To, I know there were a few other questions he didn't get answered, so we might be able to convince Jeff to stick around for a couple of minutes if you want to come up and ask him those questions afterwards. Thank you for coming. Thank you.